Hello everybody, welcome to today's session. We're going to be doing a quick hit USMLE Step 1 review covering all the antidotes uh, that you need to know. Now, this is a super high yield topic. I remember getting many questions on antidotes uh, on my actual exam. So I just wanna kind of give you a first general overview as to how you can master these when you are studying on your own. So point number one is you have to make sure you recognize the presentation uh, by clinical presentation as well as what's in the vignette that is going to be associated with the toxin that um, or the toxidrome that is going on okay either this can be by physical exam findings by vital sign changes so first off you have to key on on hey how does this toxidrome present the second thing you have to recognize is what is the mechanism of action of the toxin okay is it going to be an upper? Is it going to be a downer? You have to know the intrinsic mechanism of the toxin. And then the third step is going to be knowing the antidote, okay? And when you are going to try to master the antidote, you want to also key in on the mechanism because again, step one, all about the mechanisms. And so today's session, we're gonna kind of highlight some of the highest yield mechanisms and uh, some silly mnemonics as to how you can master the antidotes. All right, let's get started. So the first one we talk about is acetaminophen overdose. Now, acetaminophen, that is going to be Tylenol. And what's going on when you have Tylenol overdose? Well, many people know that it is hepatotoxic, but the reason why is because you have increased amounts of free radical and the specific pre free radical you have is NAPQI. And when you have this electrophile, this NAPQI, what we have to recognize is we have to give this NAPQI one electron so that it can be essentially non-harmful to our body. And how are we going to do that? Well, we are going to give N-acetylcysteine. When you have Tylenol overdose, what's going to happen is you're going to deplete your stores of glutathione. And so what we want to do when we give N-acetylcysteine is replace our glutathione. What about anticholinergic poisoning? Anticholinergics like atropine, for example. All right, so when we tackle anticholinergic poisoning, what we have to recognize first is, is the patient going to be wet, 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 or dry, 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 right? And when you are anticholinergic, you're antiparasympathetic, so you're gonna be dry, dry, dry. These patients are gonna have decreased bowel sounds, they're gonna have de a distended bladder, they're gonna have dry mouth, they are going to have bray. Uh, they're going to have tachycardia, okay? And so with atropine overdose, what are you going to do? Well, the general mechanism is you have to uh, increase acetylcholine at the synapse, and you are going to fix atropine overdose with physostigmine, and physostigmine is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. What about a benzodiazepine overdose? How's that gonna present on the step one? Well, that's going to be basically a patient who is just drunk and wobbly, exactly. And so with benzodiazepine overdose, you are going to give a benzodiazepine antagonist, and that is going to be flumazenil. And how I like to think of it is I flew over the benzodiazepine overdose. The next one is beta blocker overdose. Now, from a cardiovascular perspective, how does a beta blocker overdose, how does that present? Well, that's going to be with bradycardia and maybe even some hypotension. Recall that when diabetics take beta blockers, the classic teaching is that these diabetics are going to have a masking of their symptoms of hypoglycemia when they get beta blockers. And so that's how I kind of remember that we give glucagon to patients who have beta blocker overdose, okay? What we also have to recognize is that in beta blocker overdose, we have the potential to become hyperkalemic. Recall, when you have a beta agonist on board, you are going to push potassium into cells. So this is a beta blocker, beta antagonist. And so the other thing that you have to think about is giving the treatments for hyperkalemia, calcium gluconate, insulin, which is a beta agonist, al albuterol. Um, make sure you're giving the insulin with glucose as well. So that's an important point. All right. So beta blocker overdose, glucagon, plus think about your hyperkalemia treatment. Calcium channel blockers, also kind of the same thing. You are going to be worrying about um, low heart rate, increased AV nodal delay, and you're going to be uh, using glucagon in this scenario as well. What about cocaine overdose? Now, cocaine overdose, first off, is the patient going to be an upper or a downer? Well, the patient's going to be upper. Cocaine is going to increase your dopamine release, so you're gonna be in a very sympathetic state. The key on test questions to recognize cocaine overdose is to make sure you look at the pupils, and you see the pupils are gonna be big, big, big. These patients can be a little bit agitated. They can have nasal septal perforations as well. And so with cocaine overdose, you are going to give alpha blockers, 
if they're super hypertensive, as well as supportive care. Sometimes you have to give these patients benzos because they are at risk of hurting themselves or others. Now, why alpha blockers? First, well, there's this classic teaching that if you give a patient with cocaine overdose a beta blocker, which you don't want to do, you don't want to give a beta blocker, and the reason why is that the teaching says that if you give a beta blocker, you have the risk to undergo a hypertensive crisis by having unopposed alpha-mediated agonism, exactly. And so uh, the uh, patients who have increased blood pressures on cocaine overdose, you're going to use a nonspecific alpha blocker, something like fentolamine or phenoxybenzamine, along with supportive care. And I would say supportive care is super high yield for you to know. Cyanide overdose. Now, this is going to be interesting presentation. Usually with cyanide overdose, they're going to talk about in the question for you to recognize that they're gonna be talking about something like a house fire or a plant fire, okay? And with cyanide overdose, the patients characteristically have this almond breath. And cyanide overdose is really interesting in terms of the mechanism as to how we treat it, okay? First off, what does cyanide do? Cyanide is going to inhibit the electron transport chain. And so what we are going to do is give the antidote amyl nitrite, sodium thiosulfate, as well as cyanocobalamin. Actually, uh, in uh, many studies, cyanocobalamin is going to be uh, first line for cyanide overdose. Now, what is amyl nitrite going to do? And this is very high yield for you to recognize. Now, remember that iron usually is going to be in the Fe2 plus state, okay? And this Fe2 plus state is going to be very beneficial for something like oxygen to bind, and that's how we carry the oxygen to all of the tissues. Now, with cyanide, it's kind of interesting in the sense that cyanide actually loves Fe3+. And if cyanide loves Fe3+, well, we have to induce this Fe3 plus state. And how do we induce this Fe3 plus state? We use amyl nitrate. Now, what is this Fe3 plus state? Well, this is methemoglobinemia. So the thing that I want you to know is that in cyanide poisoning, we have to induce methemoglobinemia, okay? And that's an entity in and of itself. That's a toxidrome that you have to know. But in cyanide poisoning, induce methemoglobinemia, then you give sodium thiosulfate. And once you are going to give sodium thiosulfate, the compound that you're going to make that we can excrete is sodium thiocyanate. Okay? And so amyl nitrite, sodium thiosulfate, as well as cyanocobalamin, which is a B12 derivative, very high yield for cyanide overdose. Again, same patient in the uh, house fire is at increased risk for carbon monoxide overdose. Now, carbon monoxide overdose, remember, that can avidly bind to your hemoglobin. And what you have to recognize is that on your pulse oximetry, your pulse oximetry can actually read normal. And so with carbon monoxide poisoning, you have to recognize the presentation based on history. You may have a physical exam finding of this cherry red skin. And what you're going to treat these patients with is 100% O2. Basically, what I'm, how I think of it is you kind of are forcing off the carbon monoxide molecules off of the hemoglobin. What about digoxin overdose? Now remember, digoxin overdose is very interesting in the sense that hypokalemia can predispose you to digoxin overdose. However, digoxin overdose can cause you to become hyperkalemic. And that's important for you to recognize. Remember, digoxin is actually going to inhibit the sodium potassium ATPA. Specifically, it's going to be the potassium leaflet. And so these patients who are on digoxin and are hypokalemic, they're most at risk to get digoxin overdose. So what are we going to do in a digoxin overdose? Yeah, this one's kind of easy. We're going to normalize our potassium because they can be, once they have an overdose, they can be hyperkalemic. And we are going to give them dig fragments. What about a heparin overdose? Now, mechanism of action of heparin? Yes, it's going to potentiate the effect of antithrombin-3. Heparin overdose. Are you going to clot, 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 or bleed, bleed, bleed? And the answer is you are going to bleed, bleed, bleed. And so in heparin overdose, we need to give protamine sulfate. And how I remember that is this H in heparin helps me remember, oh, it's kind of like a proton, H+, and so protamine sulfate for heparin overdose. This is a quick 
tidbit for you to recognize is that in heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, so somebody on your USMLE that came in with the DVT, they started them on heparin, and then three to five days later, you see the platelets go kind of have falling of your platelets, you are going to switch to a direct thrombin inhibitor, which is argatroban. So argatroban saves you in heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, and so that's why I kind of wanted to put that there. What about INH overdose? Now, INH, that's isoniazid. We classically use this medication for tuberculosis, and isoniazid is going to deplete what vitamin? And that can cause peripheral neuropathy as well. And that's going to be B6. And so in isoniazid overdose, you better give some B6. What about methanol poisoning? Now, methanol poisoning, this is uh, a uh, interesting one because methanol poisoning, the classic teaching was that you can give ethanol. And the reason why is because they are saying that alcohol dehydrogenase is uh, going to uh, have competitive uh, inhibition with ethanol versus methanol. Um, but the classic uh, uh, teaching now is that you, know, you are going to be worried about um, giving them uh, ethanol because you don't want to get them more drunk, but you're going to be considering measures like dialysis. Um, you can also think of giving measures like fomipazole, um, but methanol overdose, uh, just keep that in mind for your step one. All right, this one is a in this one is for sure a high yield one, opioid overdose. So how is opioid overdose going to present? Well, opioid overdose is going to present as pin point pupils and respiratory depression. Exactly, respiratory depression. And remember, respiratory depression causes us to be hypoventilating, and hypoventilation is actually one of the mechanisms for hypoxemia, exactly. And so in opioid overdose, we are going to give naloxone or Narcan, and that is going to be a mu opioid antagonist. What about in salicylate overdose? Now, this is super high yield for you to know in terms of the presentation of salicylate overdose. So on your USMLE, likely it's gonna be a patient who has borderline personality disorder or is suicidal, for example, and the patient who has salicylate overdose will have a very interesting pH uh, type of abnormality. And the key thing that salicylate overdose causes is initially it causes a respiratory alkalosis followed by an anion gap metabolic acidosis. And so this is extremely important because this is where the USMLE can test you on a mixed acid-based disorder. Other things these salicylate uh, patients or salicylate overdose can uh, cause you to have is something like ear ringing, and that tinnitus can be a key buzzword. And so what are we going to give in salicylate overdose? Well, we're going to give sodium bicarbonate, and essentially sodium bicarbonate is going to ionize the uh, salicylate compound such that once you ionize it, you give it a charge, and so it will be actually excreted in the urine. What about TCA overdose? So TCA overdose, these are all going to be your ipramines or tri tricyclic antidepressants, right? So imipramine, disipramine, et cetera, right? And so these tricyclic antidepressants, they're actually going to cause the four Cs. And what are the four Cs? Coma, convulsions, cardiotoxicity or QT prolongation, as well as having anticholinergic symptoms, okay? And so in TCA overdose, if you have QT prolongation especially, you are going to give sodium bicarbonate as well. And again, same theory is to ionize the compound. What about barbiturates? Now, unlike benzodiazepines, barbiturates are going to increase not the frequency, but the duration of the GABA channel being open, okay? And for barbiturates, you are also going to use sodium bicarbonate. And barbiturates are going to present kind of like benzodiazepine um, overdose as well, except these patients may be a little bit sleepier or a little bit sicker. Warfarin overdose. Now, warfarin, what is the mechanism of action? Yep, exactly. It blocks the activation of your 27910, uh, your vitamin K dependent factors. And so in warfarin overdose, acutely what you're going to be giving them is their FFP. And what is FFP going to do? Well, it's going to replete their 2, 7, 9, and 10, especially protein C and protein S. However, as a long-term agent, you're going to use vitamin K, and that's uh, to kind of build up uh, the stores. Ethylene glycol poisoning. Well, kind of like methanol poisoning, ethylene glycol poisoning, we are going to be thinking of blocking 
alcohol dehydrogenase by using fomipazole. You can think about this historical competitive antagonism with ethanol, as well as uh, considering uh, dialysis in very severe cases. Insecticide overdose. Now, insecticide overdose, also known as organophosphate overdose, organophosphate overdose. Basically, in insecticide overdose, the questions are going to resolve or revolve around a child who's playing behind a garage and suddenly he has bronchospasm, he has abdominal cramping, diarrhea, he's going to have lacrimation, salivation, he's going to be wet, wet, wet. And so insecticide overdose, what are you going to be thinking of? Yeah, exactly. You are going to be thinking of, oh my gosh, I have too much acetylcholine. And when you have too much acetylcholine, well, you are going to treat that by blocking the uh, receptor end and you're going to be using things like atropine. And what you want to do is you want to regenerate the acetylcholinesterase enzyme because right now the acetylcholinesterase enzyme in the insecticide or organophosphate poisoning is going to be um, uh, kind of captivated by the organophosphate. And that's why you have too much acetylcholine. And so what you want to do is you want to kick off this organophosphate from the acetylcholinesterase. And what you're going to do is before, um, uh, before this uh, patient has aging of the enzyme, essentially what you're going to do is give pralidoxamine or 2-PAM, and that kicks off this organophosphate. What about iron overdose? Now, iron overdose, that can be caused by you know somebody eating an excess amount of iron, also, like iron tablets. Um, also, it could be due to patients who have, for example, hemochromatosis. You can even have secondary hemochromatosis presented to you on the USMLE when a child who has beta thalassemia, who is going to have recurrent blood transfusions, they are going to be in an iron overloaded state. And so iron overdose, you're going to be using things like deferoxamine, and so ferrous is in there, so that helps me remember it. You can also phlebotomize them, and you can give vitamin C. What about lead overdose? Now, classically, they say lead overdose, that's going to um, be a child who lives in an old house or lower SES, and the kid is eating the paint chips, so that's one presentation. But sometimes they don't even put that. And what I would say is that lead overdose or lead poisoning is a very nonspecific uh, type of presentation. So these kids can be fatigued. They can have some constipation. They can also have intellectual delay or um, a regression in their milestones. And so that's why I would kind of keep this toxidrome of lead poisoning uh, in, in the back of your mind. Remember, lead is going to inhibit ferroketolase, and that's an important um, biochemical uh, tie-in. And so with lead overdose, you are going to use things like succimer because having lead poisoning sucks. EDTA kind of has lead in it, right, the spelling in it, as well as dimer caprol. What about these other heavy metals, arsenic, mercury, gold, gold overdose, that would be kind of bling bling, right? So you would use succimer, EDTA, as well as dimer caprol. Copper overdose. Now, what is the classic copper overload disease? You got it. That's going to be Wilson's disease. Watch for the patients who has uh, signs of Parkinsonism. They have those Kaiser Fleischner rings in their eye. They're going to uh, also have a predisposition to having cirrhosis. And so copper overdose, you're going to use penicillamine. And how I remember that is copper pennies. All right, everybody. So that was a quick hit on antidotes. I hope you enjoyed uh, this video and found great value. Make sure you uh, relay any feedback that you have, and I will definitely see you in the next video. Thanks so much.